Welcome into the Lucas and Lucas podcast. Lucas Frankel and Mike Lucas with you here for a special NBA trade deadline special. But we'll begin and only the place where the NBA truly matters, Cleveland, Ohio. They won 15 out of 16. Mike, I'm so excited to come up to Cleveland in June for the parade around the lake for the Cavaliers' first championship post-LeBron James. I don't know how you're feeling, but that's how I'm feeling right now. Uh, Not just first championship post-LeBron, first championship ever without LeBron. They won 15 of 16. They are arguably the deepest team in basketball right now. They have 10 guys, 11 if you count Craig Porter Jr., whose minutes fluctuate because it's on a two-way contract, 12 guys if you want to include Tristan Thompson in the mix, who are all playing and contributing. They're working Darius Garland and Evan Mobley back into this new offensive system they developed when those two guys got hurt in mid-December. Since then, they've been on an absolute tear. They've won 15 of 16. They're 20 and 4 in their last 24 games. They're the hottest team in basketball right now. They are not a perfect matchup for some of the other teams in the Eastern Conference. They have some smaller wings, which may prove to be their fatal flaw against New York or Boston, but we'll get to the playoffs when that matters. What matters right now is there is no team in the NBA playing better, more cohesive basketball than the Cleveland Cavaliers. And what's most impressive, Frank, and I know it's the regular season, none of this matters, so they do it in the postseason, so take this all with a grain of salt, but they can beat you with offense, in two different ways, pick and roll, or they could shoot 23 or 46 from three like they did against Sacramento on Monday, 50%. You make 23 threes, you're going to win. They could also suffocate you defensively like they did on Wednesday against the uh, Washington Wizards, holding Jordan Poole scoreless in a game and holding Washington to 104 points. So they're versatile, they're deep, and Donovan Mitchell is playing like an MVP candidate. You add those three things together, and you got what is one of, if not the best team in basketball right now. Best team in basketball. You're willing, to, you're willing to go that far. I said maybe. Maybe. I said one of, if not the best. I, don't, I, I still think Boston's the best team in the East. I wouldn't pick them over Denver. I wouldn't take them over OKC. Probably not even the Clippers in a seven-game series. But on December 15th, Frank, the Cleveland Cavaliers were 13-12 and 12 in ninth place in the Eastern Conference. Since December 15th, they are playing as well, if not better, than any team in the NBA. They still have to prove it in the postseason. But right now, we have to deal with the information we have. No team's playing better than the Cavs right now. I mean, this this kind of reminds me of uh, what was going on with the Browns toward the end of the season. Everyone in Cleveland was like thinking Super Bowl, Super Bowl, Super Bowl, and then you go out, you know, in round one, exit. Like the, it, it's so there's so much basketball left to play. Any any given moment, there could be an injury, something. There could be a situation that no one sees arising that could just change the whole complexion of stuff. So, uh, what I would advise Cavs fans to do. And the city of Cleveland to do is just don't get ahead of yourself. Like this, this nucleus of players has never accomplished anything. Donovan Mitchell, as we all know, has never accomplished anything. This Cavs team going into the playoffs last year, everyone was towards thinking that this is a team that could make be a sleeper dark horse team in the East. And what did they do? They got lost to the Knicks, I believe, in five games. Five so games. Like, it was bad. It was bad. Like so, so like as, as exciting as this is right now, and, it's, and it, listen, it's, it is exciting, but all I would ask is. Stop getting ahead of yourself because you, I, you, I know, like you, especially now, you got the Cavs background. Like, well, that's good. Although I have, I have the Cavs background because we just know, launched the ultimate show. Cavs show. So I know, <laughs> but like, let's just calm down for a second because we got another team in New York City, the New York Knicks, who I believe yeah. are way more serious to threat in the East than the Cleveland Cavaliers, a team that beat the Cavs in the playoffs last year. The Knicks, Boyan Bogdanovich, Alec Burks, back to the Knicks. Knicks have the third best odds to win the East, only trying to sell the Bucks. Better odds than the Cleveland Cavaliers. We got Jalen Brunson. We got Julius Randle who's coming back from injury soon. We got OG Ananobi. We got now Bogdanovich, who's an average 20 point per game score from the Detroit Pistons. This te- Knicks team is as tough a team as we've seen in the NBA. There is very little weaknesses. Jalen Brunson is a bona fide superstar. This Knicks team, the sky's the limit, Mike, and I wanted to revise my Team USA roster. Jalen Brunson's got to be on it. This dude is a flat-out gamer in every conceivable way. The Knicks, the city of New York, should be thankful that the Dallas Mavericks are stupid enough to choose Kyrie Irving over him, despite how well Kyrie Irving has played when he does actually take the floor, because he is playing well, but Jalen Brunson... His dunk against Brooklyn the other day, by the way, I did not know he had that in him. I'm just going to be honest. I did did not know he could do that. He had dunks with the Nets, so like... If I, I remember there was a dunk he had with the Nets. I, I don't remember which game it was or who it was against, but it was nice. And it was like, whoa, Kyrie. But he only pulls that out at certain moments. I feel like he could be more of a high flyer, but 
only pulls him out a couple times a season, but it was not, listen, it was nice. He played great against the Nets. I'm not, I'm can say I'm pretty much done watching Nets basketball, but the they Nets. Play the Caps tonight. I, I, yeah, I, I'm not going to be watching, but <laughs> I'm certainly not, I'm not going to be watching. I'll be watching Gossip Girl because that's my new show, but oh, nice. Have you seen it? No, but I'm watching Euphoria right now, which is, I think, like the modern day version of Gossip Girl in a way. So. Euphoria is, gets very, very dark. Yeah, it's already dark. I just started. It's already dark. Yeah, it's um, it, it, I I really like Euphoria. My fiance does not love it because of the darkness, but it, that is a very good show. Um, but back to the Knicks, things could not be any looking any better with James Dolan, Mad Square Garden. Love what I'm seeing right now from the Knicks, and I wouldn't be surprised if they end up in the Eastern Conference Finals. Frank, what I love about you is the way that you want to hype up teams that you know will never be crash. And I know exactly what you're doing with the Knicks. And but I, but I, I'm doing. I mean, I, I'm saying pump the brakes in the Cavs, but I truly believe that the Knicks. Well, I agree. Like, I don't say they have a better chance than the Cavs, but I think they're both in the same category of they're tier two contenders in the East under the Boston Celtics. And if you want to tell me you want to put Milwaukee in there, I personally wouldn't, but. I'll default to Giannis and Dame in the playoffs. The thing with the Knicks, and we touched on today's show a tiny bit after the Bogdanovich move. Like, they're jumbo. They're they're a massive team outside of Jalen Brunson, who's a bit of an undersized point guard. Their lineup now is OJ Anobi, 6'8", strong dude on the wing. Bogdanovich, 6'8", strong dude on the wing. Julius Randle, 6'9", when healthy. And then you either have Hartenstein... Or Mitchell Robinson, if he is he coming back this year? Is Robinson going to be able to play in the playoffs? Do you know? Um, I believe he's coming back. I mean, well, look, look that up while I'm, I'm finishing this point. But then you got Robinson, and off the bench, you now have he's doing on court activities after the All Star break, so he'll be back. So he'll be right. back. So you have you know then Hartenstein coming off the bench. You have Josh Hart potentially coming off the bench. Dante Divincenzo, like that's an eight man rotation right there. That's as good as any team in the East. And I would even put that up against the Boston Celtics. And what the Cavaliers' weakness is, and they didn't address this at the deadline, I'm curious. And we expected them not to make a move, but I think they're going to end up getting a buyout guy. But the Cavs' guards, Mitchell is 6'2", Garland is 6'0". Their small forwards are 6'4", 6'5". They don't have a big wing. And if they play a team like the Celtics or the Knicks now, they're going to have to guard these 6'8", 6'9", wings with – severely undersized guards and it's just a bad physical matchup. Now that doesn't mean the Cavs can't outshoot New York or Boston. The Cavs can't out scheme or shut them down defensively. I'm just saying from a pure physical standpoint, the Knicks and the Celtics poise some really difficult matchup problems for the rest of the Eastern conference, specifically Cleveland in this case, but not a lot of teams can go six, eight and taller across the board. And I don't think the Celtics do because Jalen Brown is six, six, and he's in the same range. But you get what I'm saying. Like, they have some supersized wings now. And the, the Celtics don't even have that. They start Derek White and Drew Holiday, who aren't 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, so, uh, it's going to be a difficult matchup. And the Knicks are really good, Frank. And Thibodeau, let me ask you this real quick. I'm putting you on the spot. This wasn't in the rundown. Today, right now, December, uh, February 7th, who's your NBA coach of the year? Today, right now. NBA coach of the year. I think there are five, I think there are five candidates you can make a legitimate case for. So, I actually... The head coach of the Oklahoma City Thunder. Dagnalt's one of them. What he's, I mean, the fact that they're tied for the first in the West is pretty freaking unbelievable. The fact that the Timberwolves are tied for these is pretty unbelievable. But here's my issue with coach of the year. And I talked about this the other day, and it's going to come up when the NFL honors here on Thursday night when either Stefanski or D'Amico Ryans wins, is that it always goes to the to the team that there was the least amount expected from and that, that, that rose above the occasion. So, like, the best teams and, like, the best coach teams never get rewarded. That really bothers me because, like, in the in the NFL, like what Andy Reid did this year with with that cast of characters, of, of you, you know, know. Who I actually think should win the NFL Coach of the Year. This can sound crazy. I think Mike Tomlin should be the NFL Coach of the Year to get ten wins out of the quarterback trio of Kenny Pickett, but Mitch I, I, no, Trubisky, no, 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 and if, if you're arguing about that. I think if you're arguing about which team overcame the the most and still like got to a point where the, that wasn't expected, it's the Cleveland Browns. I mean, they lost Chubb in week two. They lost. That, I think Stefanski's gonna win. I'm just saying there's another guy. No, no, no. In but, the I, same but I think category. that if you're if you're looking at it based on those Stefanski versus Tomlin, I'd give Stefanski a major edge. Yeah, the Browns had higher expectation. I, like, but they, 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 they have similar. No, 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 no. Wrong, 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 wrong. They did. They're both projected playoff teams. Forget about the projections, Mike. The Browns lost Nick Chubb. They lost to Sean Watson. 
They lost like their second. And th- D- 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 Joe Flacco, I'm sorry, but that wasn't even on the team before. Like at least Mason Rudolph was there. Penny Pickett. Let me, like, let me ask you a question. There. Right now. Wait, before the season, would you have taken Joe Flacco or any of the three Pittsburgh quarterbacks? Any of the three Pittsburgh quarterbacks. Okay, then that, that we'll, we'll never see that eye on this. Then so Joe back, Flacco, back I, in my mind, Joe Flacco was so washed that there was no way that he would be able to eat. eat <laughs> be remotely productive ever again. And the fact that like they found a yeah. team that made him look like competent and, and like someone who could actually play quarterback was like shocking to me. So if you're arguing Stefanski versus Tomlin, it's clear undisputed winner is Kevin Stefanski in that argument. But what I'm, what I'm the point, I I'm agree, make, but that's okay. the point I'm trying to make is that like the John Harbaugh, the Andy Reeds, the Kyle Shanahan's get like no credit for these awards ever. And it's like, wait, Dan Campbell should also just be the NFL. Numbers. It's also in baseball where, the, it's it's never like the best teams. It's always the the most surprising or the team that dealt with the most injuries. It's never which, which, well in well in the NBA right now, Frank. I think the five of the six can or five candidates that you could legitimately make a case for are like five of the seven best teams in basketball. I mean, I had my five candidates. Talking, just, just so you know, coach, I mean, I, I, I mean, if I'm being frank, perfectly honest, I cannot name all the coaches off the top of my head. But well, I, I'll give you the five candidates. You tell me just based off your quick. Like, we didn't plan for this. This is off the dome. Dagnall of OKC. Chris Finch in Minnesota, Tyrone Lue in Los Angeles. They were a train wreck, got hardened. Honestly, now- Tyrone Lue gets my vote. What he's been able to do with those personalities and be uh, knocking on the door for Topsy in the West, he's my he's my vote. Thibodeau in New York Timber and JB Bick- and Bickerstaff in Cleveland for it's losing Timber Garland and Those are the two guys. Who? It's uh, Tyrone Lue versus Tom Thibodeau in my mind for the coach of the year. I think it's Lue versus Dagnall in OKC, but. I just I feel like the Knicks being this good is like I mean they are they are I mean they look like world beaters right now and and they're and the guys are beat up and they're still like playing incredible basketball. As for the Clippers, I think that like the Kawhi, Paul George, and getting James Harden, everyone was so ready to write them off, and the way they've been able to play cohesive basketball and look like one of the best teams in the NBA with with guys who. I mean, I I never I, I I was ready to just like James Harden the Clippers. What a terrible idea! They're just an absolute train wreck. They'll never be good ever again. They look like an. I mean, they were playing incredible basketball. The Thunder, the Thunder is an interesting one, and and that's a tough call um, between those three because all they're all tough. They're all playing incredible, incredibly. I just think that with SGA and like and we knew Chet was going to be good. I feel like the foundation was more there for OKC to be playing well. And I'm way more surprised about how well the Clippers are playing and how well the Knicks are playing. Um, I'm, I don't disagree on the Clippers part, but if you everything you said about the Knicks, J.B. Bickerstaff and Cleveland just done a little bit better. They're a better team right now. They have a better record, higher seed in the East. They lost two bigger players for bigger portions of the season. Darius Garland and Evan Mobley missed a month and a half each. So, you know, if you're going to use that argument, I know yeah, you're but, on Nick's favorite right but now. Honestly, Hashtag honestly, Nick's honestly tape, Mike, but... The, 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 but as you, I think you made this point before. The Cavs losing those players made Mitchell thrive better and made Jared Allen thrive better. So, like, The coach had to adjust their whole system. So wouldn't that be a nod to his coach of the year? Or it, or yeah, it allows the players on the team to be able to play more freely and it gets rid of any potential, like, whose ball is it? Who's the captain of this team? It, it, like sometimes, Mike, when when guys like leave it, it allows other players to like play more freely. And I, and maybe in I, the Cavs case, unless I get that coaching, I'm not, I'm not gonna like bang my head against the wall and argue with it. But I think maybe we, we didn't plan. We didn't like so we didn't plan for that. Bill, Bill, Bill Simmons made this point like the other day. It was like when Garland went out, that allowed Donovan Mitchell to blossom into this guy who truly looks like an MVP candidate. And you know, if Garland never gets hurt, maybe the Cavs aren't playing as well. Well, the the counter side of that is instead of playing two bigs, they went to four out one in, which forced Mitchell into the point guard spot. So it's a it's a combination. It's coaching. It's Mitchell blossoming into the the MVP candidate he has this year. But it's an interesting. Con- We're gonna do it on the show tomorrow. We we touched on it quickly today. I told the guys to prepare. So uh, next week, Frank, come back. It'll change in a week, but come back with a, a presentation on why it's Tom Thibodeau. I mean, I I mean I'm. I, I was I, I thought like because when Tom Thibodeau teams usually what happens is they reach a point where he wears them out and it's sort of like all right his whatever he's saying he's lost the team it's over with but it looked like we reached that point last year with Thibodeau but he's been able to you know reinvigorate the team and they're back to you know playing the, as hard as they were I believe in year one with him when they made the playoffs and had an early exit but um it, it looks like the Knicks are like 
rejuvenated here and poised to be a serious contender in the East. And I would honestly, Milwaukee, I just with Doc Rivers and and I don't trust lack them. of the lack of assets they have, even though they got Patrick Beverly today. I just I just don't think that they have enough to get over the hump. I don't I think Dame is too inconsistent at this point to truly be trusted to be a good wingman to Giannis. And after that, I don't really trust their guys. And this whole Doc Rivers coaching situation, I don't know if it's ever gonna mesh. So we'll see. I just think the Knicks are the second best team in the East. And if they could, you know, find themselves in the Eastern Conference Finals against the Celtics, like I I really like the Knicks chances in that's in that in that matchup. I think that Tebedo has a huge coaching advantage over Missoula in that in that head to head matchup. Um, I don't disagree. Knicks are really good. Cavs are good too. It, uh, they're on a collision course to play in the first round again, and it will be awesome. Be a great the, elsewhere in New York City, the Brooklyn Nets uh, made a couple moves here. They traded Spencer Dinwiddie for Dennis Schroeder. Uh, Dinwiddie is going to get bought out by the Toronto Raptors and maybe hopefully go back to the Dallas Mavericks. But Nets got Dennis Schroeder. They trade away Royce O'Neal to the Suns. Uh, according to our sports line projections at CBS – the Nets playoff percentage just went from 19% before these moves to 30%, which I was pretty surprised by. Um, Is that because other teams as opposed to what the Nets did? I think Dinwiddie was such a minus to the team that, like, just getting him off the team, like, boots them up big time. And hey. I think Dinwiddie was my least favorite Net. He was great a couple years ago, but, you know, before they got Durant and Kyrie. Uh, but in the last few years, in the, in the last couple of years, he's just been terrible. He, he's a reckless shot taker. Uh, complains after every possession. One of my least favorite players to watch in the entire league. So glad he's gone. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, like I saw tweets about from some people <laughs> next to Twitter, like, oh, we're not a championship team. Like, who cares? Like, like uh, I've already resigned to the fact that Nets will never be title contenders ever again. I'm just glad Spencer did when he's off the team. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I think the moves in the big picture are pretty inconsequential. Schroeder will help him a little bit, but they're a playing team at best. So whether they're the seven, eight, nine, ten seed, that's that's their ceiling, and they're gonna lose in the first round of the playoffs. So yeah, I mean they I, got rid of O'Neal, got a couple picks. Maybe that helps them get a player down the road. But in the in the grand scheme of things, today was a day where the Nets decided not to trade Dorian Finney Smith, which I think is the most interesting of all their moves, Frank. Not the one they made, the one they didn't. Because they apparently turned down two first round picks for DFS a few weeks ago. Whether or not that's true, who knows? That was just the report. I mean, that that, that could have been that could have been from like the Celtics. It could have been from the Bucks. It could have been from the Clippers. Like, like those may, uh, de facto second round picks. Uh, but I'm uh, but I'm just saying, if they had that on the table to where they theoretically could have picked up even one first round, I would have traded DFS for one first round pick. So, and I know the 2024 draft is weak, and teams don't really want to be. Uh, associated and give up picks in that draft or, or get picks, excuse me, in that draft because it's a weaker draft class. But, you know, you could always turn two 2024s into one 2025, theoretically. So I just thought they, they hoarded a couple of assets for a team that has a ceiling, a ceiling, if everything went right, Frank, of a second round exit. The, the, I mean, the only, the only way things turn off for the Nets is if Ben Simmons decides he wants to play every game and play at least 30 to 35 minutes a game. But my inclination is that the rest of the year, he's a 20-minute max per game guy. And he's not going to play back to backs, and that's sort of what he is at this point. Still a really productive player when he's actually on the floor, but who knows how much of that was actually we're actually going to see the rest of the season. Uh, but we had, the last thing about the NBA, uh, it really just like re like made me angry again at Eric Adams when Kyrie was on the on the floor, <laughs> park, like talking to the fans, saying blame Eric Adams for like the reason why I'm playing so good now and was so like inconsistent with that. It just like made me so mad again. Um, yeah, I just feel like. If they would have just let Kyrie play him and it wasn't a hypocritical thing, but whatever. I, I don't want to talk about it anymore. We have the Super Bowl coming up on Sunday. Patrick Mahomes, fourth appearance in the last five years. I mean, the AFC is going to be running through the Chiefs until my kids are in college. Yeah, they're really good. Patrick Mahomes is, you know, if he wins this, I'm putting him over Brady in my unofficial record book. Like, he'll be the GOAT. Uh, I don't care that he only has four, three, or whatever, three versus Brady seven. He'll be better than Brady in my mind. He's already better than Brady in my mind anyway if he loses, but that's just the way to stick it to Patriot fans. I, at the end of the day, Frank, I think San Francisco is a better overall team, but I do think the pressure – We thought the same – I mean, we, to, we, yeah, we thought the same thing about the Ravens, though. Like, the Ravens, were, I thought, were an all-around better team than the Chiefs, but – Which is why I'm picking the Chiefs again. Yeah, it's the Mahomes thing, man. It, it. I talked to we talked to two guys on Radio Row this week. Darren Smith is our guy. He works in Kansas City. We also talked to Sean Merriman, and I kind of asked this question. Bill Simmons brought it up, but I wanted to know if someone in Kansas City felt the same way. 
Does Patrick Mahomes pure existence force other teams to do wonky weird things, go out of their way, go out of their tendencies because they're not just playing the Chiefs, but they're trying to beat Patrick Mahomes. And Darren Smith, who he's the beat reporter, covers them, said, I've been saying this for four years now. And I'm glad other people are kind of starting to catch on. And then Sean Merriman, who obviously played in the league for a while, uh, was in that 2004 draft class, was an all pro, kind of like thought about it for a second. And he is like, I hadn't really, I hadn't ever really thought of it in that instance. But even back when I was playing, and I'm paraphrasing Sean Merriman here, even back when I'm pl- when I was playing, like when we played Tom Brady, we always tried to do stuff that wasn't necessarily in our DNA. And I never thought of it as we're trying to beat Tom Brady, but yeah, that, that kind of that kind of happens. And I'm just we saw it with Baltimore, we saw it with Buffalo, Buffalo with Josh Allen, instead of checking down on a couple attempts late in the game. Josh Allen tried to go for the home run, the knockout punch on Mahomes. The Ravens decided not to run the ball with the running backs whatsoever. Lamar Jackson tried to tried to prove he could win with his arm instead of taking off and using his legs to pick up some crucial third downs in the, the second half there. So I don't know what or if it'll happen in the Super Bowl, but we're betting on arguably the greatest quarterback ever and a guy playing the biggest game of his career for the first time who's looked okay in the playoffs. What would you grade Brock Purdy in the playoffs? B plus, B B minus C plus somewhere in that range. Like, I mean, I, I, okay? I gotta give him an A. I gotta give him an A minus. Like, he hasn't like set the world on fire, but every time they needed him to make a play, he's made it. So like, A minus is a little high. He's, he's been he's been solid. He's been all right. He's not. He hasn't. But when when push comes to shove and they, and they needed him to make a play, he's made it every single time. So like, as much as I'm a, I'm a critic of him. And this is why I'm so like high on Kyle Shanahan and why I think that like he should be coach of the year. Like he freaking made, got a one with Brock freaking Purdy. Brock freaking Purdy. I mean, I know the roster is unbelievable and they have the arguably the most offensive talent in the league with McCaffrey and Kittle and Debo and Ayuk and you know the list goes on and on and Trent Williams, Williams and defensively with Bosa and Fred Warner. And like they're just absolutely loaded. So like that's why he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. But Kyle Shanahan's one hell of a coach. I I think like he he might be like the best coach in the league. The way that because we saw Bill Belichick loses Tom Brady and you know can't figure out a way to build a winning team. And Kyle Shanahan has had you know so many different stages of quarterbacks from Garoppolo to Purdy and whoever. And like it doesn't like it doesn't matter. He's still like building an elite team. And and then that's why I'm so impressed with Kyle Shanahan and why I think he might be the best coach in the entire league. Him and Andy Reid are obviously uh, the top two. But speaking of Belichick. Him and Vrabel and McDaniel, I'm just really surprised him, him and Vrabel didn't get hired in this cycle. I thought, going in, I thought Vrabel was the best coach to, to hit the market. I mean, I said, made my point about Belichick. I think he's overrated. Six who rules, it speaks for itself. He's a Hall of Famer. But in terms of actually, like, being an tr- amazing coach and being able to do stuff with, you know, crappy ingredients, like, I, I just don't think that he is, that's not his wheelhouse. Like, he was great with Brady, mm-hmm. average, below average without Brady. Kyle Shannon has proven that he's unbelievable basically no matter who he has. And I feel the same way about Vrabel. Vrabel, I feel like it's great about uh, coaching teams and making them much better than they probably should be. And uh, I I kind of found the report funny that about how he Vrabel's too intimidating, too big to be. That that was funny. Like, what are are we talking about here? (laughs) That was objectively like the biggest, the fattest head coach of all time. Yeah, that was hysterical report. Frank, what's interesting now, we're in the same situation here as a someone who covers the Cleveland Browns and you a Jets fan here. Both of our coaches, and I believe Sal is in this position, if I'm, if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong. Kevin Stefanski does not have a contract extension yet. He's going into the last year of his deal. I believe the same is true for Robert Sala, correct? I'm not sure what Sala's contract situation is, but I'll fire him in a second for Mike Vrabel and not blink. Well, that's, that's my point. So whether it's the last year of his deal or not, I think any coach – that is not a proven legitimate commodity heading into 2024. And Stefanski is, but he doesn't have a contract extension. So either guys on the last year of their deal or guys like Sala, they start the season under immense pressure, especially if they have a good roster, because an owner could look out there and say, Rabel, Rabel, that guy is sitting right there. And I think it's going to add an extra layer of pressure with Belichick Hell, Pete Carroll's out there too. Uh, Mike Vrabel, just those, those three in particular, where you have three certified, legitimate, I won't call them all A plus, but proven head coaches in this in this league. And if an owner looks at his roster and says, 
we got a good roster. Why aren't we as successful as we should be? One of those guys can help me. I think it puts a lot of head coaches in, in the NFL in a really uncomfortable, pretty unfair position next season. It's going to add a, an extra layer of pressure, especially because we've seen owners now, and I'll, I'll, rep, I'll use Jimmy Haslam as an example. Like In Cleveland, Jimmy Haslam wants to win and wants to win now. Like, like not in two years, like, like right now. He knows his time is ticking. Jerry Jones, Mike McCarthy's in the same situation. Like, there's like that looming elephant in the back of the room, and there's that guy standing over your shoulder when you necessarily shouldn't be under that pressure from the get-go. But I think in week one, guys like Stefanski, if he doesn't get an extension, McCarthy, Salah, just to name a few, are going to have that presence looming behind them because there's never been a free agent coaching class that's as good as the three that are sitting right there today. Yeah, I, I just feel like Bel- like next year, Belichick's going to be a head coach, and his defensive coordinator is going to be Brable, and his offensive coordinator is going to be McDaniels, and I just feel like that's like that's like bounty. <laughs> but I, I, the biggest swing and miss that no one's talking about is Eric Bieniemy choosing to leave the Chiefs to be the commander's offensive coordinator and then getting fired after one year. Like, that is just a horror. Like, I, I guess that he thought that you know, maybe if Ron Rivera got fired, he would have been next in line. But, man, swing and a freaking miss because Mahomes keeps on moving and Bieniemy is now out of a job, and – there's not really many openings this year, so he'll have to be like one of those like senior offensive assistants or whatever. And, and he just missed there was that. a lot of talk when the Browns were looking to hire an offensive coordinator for B enemy, and I have a hard time looking at anything that happens in Kansas City, even during his time there, and thinking that that wasn't just a result of Patrick Mahomes' brilliance and being teamed I mean, up with someone, someone to Belichick and Brady. Brady. Like when, yeah. when you, when, it's like it's like I mean, it's sort of similar, like. When all the there was a period of time where like Romeo Cornell, Charlie Weiss, like all these like Patriot assistants, like all these teams were going after the Patriot assistants, and none of them were ever successful because you know why they didn't have Tom Brady. You know why all the yeah. Chiefs guys aren't good because they don't have Patrick Mahomes. You want to know why all the? I get your point, but like, like Matt Nagy's the oh, Aaron, sorry, Aaron, sorry, the other one was Aaron Rodgers guys with Ben McAdoo and whoever else was on that staff, like Matt, uh, like, Luf- uh, uh, Nathaniel Hackett, sorry, yeah. Hackett, but like uh, Matt Nagy's there now. Matt Nagy was a terrible head coach in Chicago. If someone hired Matt Nagy, I still think he's a terrible coach. Like, just because he had decent success with Patrick Mahomes. And with the enemy, when people in Cleveland were like, well, look at his track record. He had, you know, top five offense. I was just not impressed with what he did in Washington this year. Nothing against the enemy. Seems like a nice enough guy. Like I said, our guy, Darren Smith, huge fan of his and raves about what he did in Kansas City. And maybe he's right and maybe I'm totally wrong. But I, they had so much talent and weapons in – uh, in Washington this year. I know the offensive line was abysmal, and Sam Howell is an average at best quarterback, but I just didn't like some of the offensive schemes, philosophies they were throwing out. There were too many games they put up giant nothing burgers. So, yeah, sometimes you bet on yourself, Frank, and it fails, and that was a chance for Biennemi to prove he wasn't a product of the Reed Mahomes marriage, and, you know, his story's not over. He's going to get another chance to be an offensive coordinator, but the one-year up-to-this-point grade for Eric Biennemi is – by himself is not good. Yeah. So we'll see what happens there. I do find it interesting, though, that Cliff Kingsbury did end up with Washington as a second overall pick. And whether that sort of signals that he has intel that the Bears are going to keep field and maybe trade the pick to Washington, I'm just that, that That's where that seeing Kingsbury and Washington sort of made my eyebrows raise a little bit if the Bears are actually considering seriously considering trading that pick to Washington. It'd be the dumbest decision ever if they don't draft. I, I, listen, I, I'm on board with that, but I just know there's a lot of Bears fans who want to try to maybe move that pick, keep fields, and just add more power. I, listen, if I'm with the Bears, I'm drafting Caleb Williams, and I'm thinking twice about it. But I said it today to one of the guys that I work with. The AFC Championship game, Lamar versus Patrick Mahomes, is like the perfect three years down the road encapsulation of what the Bears are potentially doing with this first overall pick. Justin Fields is a tremendous runner, but uh, like on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you that he's a good quarterback? Purely a quarterback, passing the ball-wise. Like a four, a five tops. I was going to say a five. Yeah, like, I mean, it's not even a knock. We just haven't seen it long enough. And you see Lamar, and my big knock on Lamar, and I think it's fair, is when he's forced to throw the ball in a playoff situation, like, you can't feel confident. Lamar's played uh, nine playoff games or six playoff games now, and the results aren't there. Justin Fields at his best, will he be better than Lamar Jackson? Like, if he reaches his full potential, is he 70% of Lamar, 80%? You got a chance to draft the next Mahomes. Like, you you can't pass up that opportunity. So 
it'd be a, it, it'd be a real mistake in my opinion. And it's, I think Justin Fields is fine. I just don't think he's a Super Bowl quarterback. And you have a chance without giving up assets to draft the future of your franchise, reset the rookie quarterback contract uh, clock, and use the rest of the money you're not paying a quarterback to build around him. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a, a, a big mistake if the Bears do not draft a quarterback one overall. Last point. So Lamar's Lamar has won MVP. It's been confirmed. Actually, it hasn't been confirmed at this very second, but it's going to happen. But I honestly, like in terms of like his career, like it doesn't really matter at this point. Like you, you, you no. failed every year in the playoffs. So like I couldn't couldn't care less that Lamar's won his MVP. Like doing the playoffs, then it was all. He, he well, last thing real quick, but based on that. No, 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 no. I have the last thing. Top five quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Assuming Mahomes. assuming everyone's healthy. Assuming everyone's healthy. Mahomes is one. Burrow. I have Burrow two as well. Josh I have Allen, Allen three. Here's where it gets interesting. I, I would still put Lamar in the in the top five. I have Lamar at five on my list. And then my fifth best quarterback. I'm just looking at the list. Hmm. That's a tough one because it's between it's between a few guys. It's between I don't I don't I I can't put two in the top five. Two is He's a good not, player, but I, I can't I can't put him in the top five. Jalen Hurts, nope. soft player, but I I just I lost confidence in him this year. Uh golf's not top five. No one on the Browns is top five. No one on the Bears, Lions, Packers, no, Vikings, no. My 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 default answer would probably say Herbert. That's who I have. Yeah, yeah, that that's where I that that'd be my top. All right, your last point now, Frank. That's all I got. Chiefs are winning the Super Bowl, <laughs> and uh, it's a coronation of Patrick Mahomes, first team to repeat since the Patriots in 03 and 04. Move over Tom Brady. Patrick Mahomes, the greatest quarterback of all time. We do we do uh, pre written headlines on every Friday show, and can I read you my headline for tomorrow? You mean for Monday? Fuck. Well, it's going to air tomorrow, but we write headlines for Monday's thing. Cavs set NBA record for largest blow in NBA history and went over Nets. No. The headline is a new <laughs> goat is born. Subhead, Mahomes erases 29-3 to deficit, surpasses Brady as the goat in McNuggets' personal record book. The only one that matters. You heard it here first, folks. And that will do it for this edition of Lucas and Lucas Podcast. We'll Peace. recap the Brooklyn Nets, Ben Simmons' resurgence, and the Chiefs. Fourth, or sorry, Mahomes' third Super Bowl title as quarterback. What a run for him. See you next week.